Hello and welcome once again to Crazy Comics and Stories. It's me, your charming and delightful old Uncle Rap Bastard. And at the other end of the series of tubes and wires that we call the internets is Joe, Crazy Writer. How you doing today, Joe? I'm 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 not too sure. Uh my I, I passed the subway and they, they got the sign up again. Satisfy your Valentine with a foot long. I, I, not sure what to make of that. I always got nervous when those ads hit, you know. Then she would smile and hold out a foot long. <sighs> yes, but we're not here to talk about my inadequacies. We're no, here we're to here talk to talk about... about potato chips. No, no, no. Yes, we are. Well, I have Kettle Brand potato chips, Peppercini, that was sent to me by Mozik Chong. And I have not oh. had time to taste them because I am to taste them on the show. And as people who've been listening for the past three weeks know, it's been crazy. Oh, yeah. So I should mention that Mozik isn't ignoring me. He sent me a nice Supergirl final figure keychain, a pocket Whoa. pop. But I didn't want to mention it because I didn't want to make Brian jealous. I am opening the bag. Yay! And um, they smell like regular potato chips, to be honest with you. I like the kettle brand. They're not kitchen cooked. But I do like kettle chips. If I buy potato chips, they're either going to be kitchen cooked, which are kettle chips, or kettle chips, because now everybody makes them. But this is kettle brand. Pepper Sini flavor. So here we go. And we lose half the audience because don't you one who said that they don't like listening to us chew? Yeah. Okay. That's good enough for me. This oh is the God. most mild Pepper Sini flavor I've ever had. There is a slight aftertaste. Uh, Peppercini. And those are the super, super mild peppers that they give you if you order Papa John's pizza, because if you're ordering Papa John's, they know you're the whitest person on the planet and oh. the hint of spice of any kind. Oh, no, this pizza was shown some oregano. Too spicy. But I don't. It says green pe bell pepper powder, garlic powder. There aren't Oh, a, the final ingredient is peppercini pulp. It has a little bit of peppercini, a little bit of green bell pepper. But other than that, it just tastes like kind of regular potato chips. So while I love potato chips, I will be having these during the Super Bowl. They're not peppercini flavored that I can really tell. However, I'll be at work. I have another snack food that I am... Uh, I've, I've grown addicted to, Joe. I picked it up at the world's biggest, at Minnesota's largest candy store. And when I'm that having, open again? Um, Mother's Day weekend. Oh, cool. And I have to ration these out, or I would eat the entire bag at once. Pop Daddy's Dutch Apple Pie Pretzel Sticks. Now, Pop Daddy also does dill pickled flavored pretzels that I adore, but I picked these up because, oh, those look silly, and the mix of caramel and apple and crunch and salt, you know, it's, it's so it's almost like ca salted caramel with apple flavor. I want to just take the entire bag and put it in my mouth, so that it is in the uh, weird Christmas foods that I have left over. Peppercini came in such a place. Sorry, Musique. Sorry. He's not sorry. He's trying to get you up his game. It's how he gets you to buy more candy and stuff for him. Don't fall for the trap. It's a trap. Meanwhile, I'm I'm just happy with uh, Junior Caramel. You know, Junior Mints. They got the Junior Caramel. Oh my God. Oh yeah, those are just, good. Just dog. Oh, 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 oh. Well, one of one of my friends made Christmas cookies. I haven't had time to make Christmas cookies yet. I'm hoping to make them Super Bowl weekend. But one of the things Minnesotans make is they take pretzels and then they take a Rolo. You know, there are lots of chewy Rolos in a roll for you. And they put that on the pretzel and then they jam down like a, a pecan or um, 
a hazelnut or some other nut and they kind of jam it in there. I'm like Barney on the Simpsons drinking with those. I have one and it's like, just shoot it directly into my veins. <laughs> but we're here, to talk about the, we're here to talk about the other addiction we have. Previews. Uh, it's previews, oh, everybody. And we're, doing it, we're doing it super early for us. Yeah, yeah. Cause, and the reason why, and we've talked about this before, we would like you to go to your local comic store and tell them, hey, I heard these idiots talking about this and it sounds interesting. Put it on my list. And also, if you see something in previews, you think we should have looked closer at it gives you enough time to, to send us an email or voicemail or whatever the heck Corey's got set up so you can communicate with us and do the same thing. And then we can always if you do, we'll talk about it, you know, because we get so little contact from people. It's like, oh, my God, an email, an email, an email. And after an hour or two of yelling email back and forth at each other, we read the email. <sighs> well, you yell email. I'm oh, what do like, you yell? Oh, you go, ahoy, hoy, ahoy, hoy. And I'm like, Corey, you don't do that to emails. It's only for <laughs> cellular. It's only phone. for phone calls. Yeah. But in this case, the previews is for number 425, February 24. The companion ones are DC Connect issue number 45 and Marvel previews number 29. And these are for comics coming out in May. For the most part. Yeah. Some, some are later. Some of them already been solicited. You really got to be careful when you're dealing with Marvels. For example, well, there was one I missed. I think it was Spectacular Spider-Man because, or Spider-Man because it was solicited through Discount Comic Book Service before it was actually in the previews. And I was like, oh God, another Spider-Man book? No, I missed it, Spider-Man. That's okay, I go to my local comic store and pick it up. But Corey, let's start like we always do. This is interactive, so grab your previews catalog. Tell us what's on the... Actually, ultra... we're going to start with DC. Oh, you want to start with DC? DC and Marvel first, because they're, kind of, do... they're, they're the big guns. <laughs> Not on my list. They're yeah, really wimping true. out. I got to tell you, I actually, I, I use the previews customer order form, and I just check off what it is I want to talk about, so I flip through the pages. But DC's not in there, so I usually have a little piece of paper with it, and it says, oh, this is what I want to talk about. Unfortunately, it did not survive the trip from work and home. So somewhere, someone's got my list of DC comics and stuff I'm going to buy. And they're but looking just, at it going, what the hell is this? Yeah, and I'm going to start right on page two and three because that's your free comic book pay solicitations. Talk to your local comic book store about getting them. We're going to go to Granite City because he'll put together a whole run of them for us. I thought it was interesting. There's the major event special edition. That's obviously, you know, it's a story. 30 years in the making, whatever. Well, what, the I'm trying ages. to figure out what story was 30 years ago. Who knows? Zero but hour. There was, there are two books for the all ages stuff. And then of course they're doing a Mad Magazine special edition, which I thought was interesting. And I'm wondering if that's comic book size or if it's going to be magazine sized. It does not say, but Joe, this issue of Mad is special. Why is this issue of Mad special and something they have not done? since the 50s no idea take a look at the cover nipples nope oh who's missing oh interesting there's no, no alfred, alfred e. Newman. e newman this is carrie cannell who does um the dc comics you know he does a lot of DC Comics humor that shows up online. It used to be in Mad, but Mad doesn't do new stuff anymore. So now he just draws them for himself. But yeah, it's the first issue since the 50s that does not have Alfred E. Newman on the cover. I, yeah, yeah. I, I'm just trying. I always thought there was something in the 70s, but I, I think it was... Uh... It was the 50s that that book came out because, you know, when I was reading all the reprints and stuff, I forget a lot of these reprints were done in the 50s. Yeah, and Alfred E. So, Newman didn't kind of become the mascot 
until after L. Feldstein took over as editor. So, so um, cool. One thing that DC that we like to highlight are first issues or creative team changes, and there's only one creative team change slash first issue. And we mentioned a couple of months ago that Action Comics was going to kind of become a kind of a rotating creator list where they're going to bring in top name creators to do short stories like Jason Aaron did a Superman story. So this month, it is a crossover story called The House of Brainiac. And it's going to be written by Joshua Williamson. There is a Superman House of Brainiac special and then Action Comics 1064 and Superman 13 are the main story. Brainiac attacks. Brainiac's Lobo army invades Metropolis in an action-packed oversized issue. The Super Family and all the heroes of Metropolis join the fight, but will they be enough to hold off Brainiac's lethal and crazed soldiers? Can Superman and Lex Luthor learn what Brainiac is searching for? He's not bottling Metropolis, so what is he collecting instead? And other than that, um, the only thing that I'm pointing out, and I'm not getting these issues because I've read them and I did not much care for them, are the reprints. And that is on page 36. We have Where Brave of the Bold, number 54, which is the first appearance of the Teen Titans, except it was called Kid Flash, Aqualad, and Robin. In the Thousand and One Dooms of Mr. Twister. Reprinting the 1964 classic that started the Teen Titans. And then under, also on that same page, showcase issue 22. And since Joe doesn't have his preview, his uh, preview. Oh, you do? Yeah, I mean, I have them, I have them marked down. I'm big on facsimile editions, especially when they're books that are up in the thousands of dollars that I'll never own anymore. So this is first appearance of Green Lantern. Again, I've read this story. I have it in the DC showcases, and they actually reprinted it in Millennium Editions when they actually shut down the Sparta plant. And I think it was either 99 or 2000, they ran off a bunch of facsimile comics from the history of DC, and this was one that was reprinted. And these suffer from that same problem I have with a lot of DC stories where they're puzzle stories and the characters are, have no character. So it's just the puzzle. The well, for art, me, the big the art is, is not what I really like. For me, what I want to see are the ads, you know, what, what's going on around it. Because so many times when they do the reprints, they just reprint the story. They don't reprint anything else with it. So that's what I kind of like in this. And I don't know, they got... For, yeah, they got the foil editions. If you like your shiny covers, they have the foil edition. That no, might be cool don't. for Showcase Twenty Two. No, yeah, they have foil variant stuff. cover by. Jackie. Oh, okay, there it is. Yeah, very small print. It's not. It's not. Well, I'm looking on the bottom line where they list the covers, and it's you know three ninety nine variant four ninety nine cardstock. Yeah. So the foil is above it. Yeah, that showcase might be cool as a foil cover. Actually, they both might be kind of cool as a foil cover. So you you have nothing between there. Uh, there is nothing new. Okay, well, let me catch up. I have I was going to point out on, on page seven, you got Nightwing. It's 113, but it's Legacy 300. It's going to have a bunch of different covers on it. So that, I always think that's interesting when they when they get to a actual number here. And again, a lot of things we're talking about, they're, we're not covering the titles that we normally collect. Oh, my gosh. Am I with you already? I'm looking... Oh, there we go. I was going to point out on page 26, eight all new stories to put a spring in your step. The DC Spring Breakout. Oh, I did not see that. I yeah. like these. Yeah, it's uh, blah, blah, blah. Spring has sprung. Flowers are blooming. Bees are buzzing. Harley is breaking King Shark out of Bell Roof <laughs> Prison. It's all right in the DCU as both heroes and villains face off on different spring breaks. Breaking out of a coffin, Lex Luthor has that covered. Spring break training, send in Superman. Breaking out of your shell, Batman and Mr. Freeze explore that possibility through a connection in their shared past. Breaking down a worthy adversary, Katana and her sword of souls might be able to tackle that. And if it wouldn't be spring break without a Teen Titans beach trip, 
All these and more. Eight breakout stories. Is there a zit breakout story? You'll have to read it and find out. A couple different variant covers, Harley variant, Batman variant. So it looks like all order variants. Nothing that you would have to, like incentive variant, you know, beg, borrow, steal to try to uh, get. I was going to point out page 28, you got the two all ages books, Teen Titans, Starfire, and Prez setting a dangerous precedent. DC's critically acclaimed political satire returns now in a young adult format. And yeah, that's an interesting experiment. I'll be interested to see how well that does, because most of the young adult stuff they do is specially made for it. But taking a series and putting it in that format as a reprint. And I and it's probably because, let's face it, Mark Russell's kind of become a name writer. And it's a good way to see, hey, would this stuff sell, especially when Prez when it came out, he was not a name writer, so it was overlooked by just about everybody. Yep. On page 32 is something interesting from the DC Vault. They're reprinting Sandman 19 Remastered. In other words, it's written by Neil Gaiman, Charles Vest did the art, and he's going back and remastering. They say it's completely remastered pages from the Eisner Award-winning colorist Steve Olaf's original hand-painted color guides. This edition of Sandman 19 also includes a forward by Steve discussing the remastering process and an all-new painted cover by acclaimed fantasy artist Charles Vest. So it's basically coloring. I'm intrigued. I like to be interesting to see what it looks like, and it's not terribly expensive. It's only $4.99, and it's yeah. a done-in-one. Basically, they're saying that when they did it before, yeah, that again, that was 30 years ago. The coloring, the printing processes have improved so much, they want to give this another go. It's also a done in the, one story. It's the Midsummer's Night Dream adaptation. Could that be the uh, 30 years ago thing? No, they're not. Oh, I'm, just, they're, I'm just saying two 30s in one book. It could it could happen. I don't think they're going to go back and do a no, big not, crossover no, race Sandman. on Sandman. Well, I don't know. What was that, Dark Knights? I'm looking at you. Anyways, so on to the collected. I'm getting it right on page one, and I recommend if you are a guy who, how would you say, invests in books, this is, I will call this my money in the bank. Money in the bank. Justice League versus Godzilla versus Kong. Why? Well, first of all, it's a fun series. I'm buying it as a regular series because I just enjoyed it. I annoyed as all hell at the variant covers because you got one with Kong, one with Godzilla, and I'm not buying a bunch of $5 variant covers. We've already talked about that last, ep last episode. But as far as a hardcover goes, this one's great because it's a licensed product. Probably will never be reprinted. Maybe we'll see a soft cover a little bit more. I'll point to one that you might not even thought of. Injustice versus Masters of the Universe. Crazy, crazy expensive to try to find it on the back issue market because it was published once and that was it. The back, the issues, the back issues are semi expensive. I mean, you can't find a decent run of them it was a what a five six issue miniseries with at least 10 bucks a pop and again it's because it's out of print and it probably won't go back in print because dc's got other things to print and why i know that is because i'm on a injustice kick i picked up not only that series but i also picked up the adventures of superman john kent miniseries where he ends up in the injustice universe uh, I've been raving on about Injustice for several podcasts, but to get back to the Justice League versus Godzilla versus Kong, if you haven't read it, it's a fun read, and if you just want to get it, leave it sealed, put it on the bookshelf, and pull it out in a year or two and sell it on the Ebays. This is one to do. Anytime you get a crossover like that, it's it's you're almost guaranteed for it. What do you have, Mr. Strode, for your first one? 
Well, first, I want to point out that the Justice League versus Godzilla versus Kong, why they're not printing this oversize, I have no idea. Maybe this maybe is they something. Might. This is something they should at least be printing treasury sized. Yes. Oh, I. Oh, and you know, I've been reading it like I said in comic book size. I, I'm drooling already. I, I would buy it. There you go, DC. That's your hundred thousand dollar idea, free of charge. If you go to page forty-five, you've got 45. the secret. Secret Six by Gail Simone, Omnibus, Volume 1. This band of outcasts have fought the world's greatest heroes and the world's deadliest villains. They've shot, swindled, scammed, and double-crossed their double crossed the very best and learned to tell the tale. The Secret Six will take any job if the price is right, but might kill each other off in the process. This has the Villains Unlimited, which was kind of the creation of this. The Birds of Prey story that spun them off, and then Secret Six, number one through six, and other stories from Countdown. <laughs> but it's another Gail Simone series that they are putting in omnibus form. If you flip the page. Well, don't flip the page yet. I go kitty corner right up. JLA Year One by Mark Wade and Brian. Oh, yeah. Preston. I recommend that. For a while. Yeah, if you've never read this, too salt. It's a great series, and here's your chance to pick it up. That's all I want. I just want to point that out because that, that's one of those I got to go back, and I don't know if I have it. If I don't, I'm buying it. And it was done to kind of smooth out the continuity because when um, – after Crisis and all the other stuff, it was, well, what was the original Justice League like? And they were doing a lot of year one stories to kind of clean things up. This was a 12-issue miniseries that did that. I loved Barry Kitson's art. Barry Kitson's art is so kinetic and so clean. He's one of those artists where I just, I don't understand why he's not getting work. Like Ron Lim. Those guys were so good at superhero comics that were easy to follow. They didn't, they didn't, you know, they, they didn't over ink everything. They didn't fill everything with a lot of scratches. Their stuff was just very clean, very efficient storytelling. Then on the next page, now I'm going to point out the Flash by William Messer Loeb's and Greg LaRoque omnibus. I'm not picking it up because I didn't care for that series enough to spend $125 on it again. But this is the Flash right after Crisis. So you've got the first few issues by Mike Barron, who Marvel kind of wooed away to do Punisher. So William Messer Loeb's came in and took over. And I liked this run of the Flash. But remember that the Flash after Crisis didn't really take off and become a huge seller till Mark Wade came on. And he came on after this run. But the one right next to it, Oh. Hitman I by Garth spent. Ennis and Joel and John oh. McRae, possibly one of my favorite superhero series of the 90s. Oh, Hitman absolutely. is the only character from what was that thing? Bloodlines or Bloodshot? Yes, bloodlines. It was Bloodlines. Where aliens, basically, if an alien tried to kill you, the antibodies they put in your body gave you superpowers. Hitman's the only character that ever got more than three appearances from that. And he was just a scumbag hitman who got superpowers. He hung out in a grungy bar, and took, jobs, who took jobs killing people, and it was Garth Ennis kind of messing around in the DC universe. Yeah. And so well written. Garth Ennis pulled in all sorts of weird DC stuff, including a demon named Bator, who the only thing he could say was, I am Bator. I, I actually think that's where have Groot, a, I think that's where Groot stole it, Joe. I actually have a custom-made Bator sitting in yes. my wife's curio cabinet. You so had that I'll, at the original shop. Yeah, I will take a picture of it, and uh, we can post it for everybody to enjoy. Because the one guy who made it, he was like, oh, my God, you got a Baytor. Yeah. How much is it? And I forget what he said. I want to say like two, three hundred bucks or something. And I go, cool. And you could see in his face like he was like, oh, shit. He didn't want to <laughs> tell it. But money, you know, money's money. 
So I am on the fence on this one, not because I mean, first of all, it, it's got a new introduction by Ennis and a forward and covered by Akria. I spent a long time getting my Hitman collection together of comics, and now I'm like, oh dear, there's I have a you know, I mean, this is like a half a long box of comics. Now I can get it down into a, it's a fair, well, a fairly big, one of bigger omnibuses, hundred over a thousand pages, but they sit on the shelf much nicer than, you know, a half a long box of comics and bag and board and everything. So I'm definitely on the fence on this one. The other reason why, and we'll get into it. There's a lot of good graphic novels being offered this month. Not necessarily by Marvel and DC, but hey, we just started. But yeah, I'm definitely, uh, that's, it. that's it, isn't it? That's it for that's DC? That's it for DC. DC, this was kind of a keep things going month. Not a lot new. Yeah. yeah. I will say this. Their omnibuses and stuff, they say, are coming out in June, which is much earlier because like Marvel, if you look at their omnibuses they are soliciting this month, they're not coming out until August, September, October. Yeah. So I don't know what DC is doing to get theirs to turn around faster. But then again, also, let's remember that they also have had delay after delay after delay after delay. What is it? I think the oldest omnibus I am still waiting for. I'm going to pull it up here because I was actually looking at it today. Dark Knight Met Death Metal. Really? Yeah. I think I got that one. Uh, this is the direct market exclusive variant edition. Okay. Solicited um, for August of 2023. All right. Hang on. I'm going to, I got to check now because I, I have that sitting you know because i'm like do i want to open it and read it because when i was trying to read it as issues it was largely incomprehensible all right unshipped items let's see i noticed they have been cleaning it up a bit although i got stuff still way back from 23. all right hang on a second let me well, go through 2023 so i haven't that. even gotten my code name rick flair variant and i got the freaking signed edition already <laughs> no i did get mine but no. so i i don't know what the deal was but i probably just got the regular one because it didn't really make a difference to me what i got i just wanted to read it so take that read it nope i haven't cracked that sucker open yet no okay it's not high on my list. I, I actually got three omnibuses this month in my in my box, but we'll talk about that when we get later. All right, Marvel next. Yes. All right, I'm going to mention it. Because we actually, I think we talked a little bit about it, but if you flip onto page six and actually just start on page two and go through it because that's all your artwork preview. Blood Hunt. Basically the vampires are going nuts. And they're going to involve the Avengers, Blade, Bloodline, Spider-Man, Hunter's Moon, T Tigra, Doctor Strange, and Clea. The Dance of Death begins in Blood Hunt. And the reason I pause, because first of all, there's tons of variant covers, which are cool. There's also, what I think you talked about it in last podcast, there is an expanded and unexpurgated polybagged red band edition, which contains additional pages of... Uh, uh, material More that blood. is too explicit for the regular edition. I will probably just buy that because in all honesty, I'm going to buy this in an omnibus. You hear that, Marvel? You're going to do, you're going to get the blood hunt out and then all the crossover blood hunts and then get the omnibus. Get the omnibus done, you get my money. <sighs> but it's out there. And also you want to keep an eye because there's certain books will be tying into it that you might not have noticed because Marvel didn't really do the, and here's all the books that are tying into it. They just kind of went well, off into their own thing. Because they're not out. This is the first issue. Next issue will have all the tie-ins. Yeah. So anyways, that's my first book. The first book that I, I am all excited about Spider-Gwen, the ghost spider, number one. Yeah, yeah, me as well. 
written by Stephanie Phillips, art by Chris Campana, trapped in the 616 for good. Welcome to New York. Gwen truly becomes a ghost spider when she moves full time to the universe where Gwen Stacy died years ago. But why did she leave Earth 65? Why aren't the other spiders supposed to know she's here? Why isn't she supposed to suit up? And who will get hurt when she does? I think having Gwen in the regular universe is messy. Because Peter Parker has the people who've died that make him go, oh, woe is me, I can't. And Gwen is one of them. So now Gwen's going to show up about uh, 15 years younger. I know. Which, yeah, that's weird. And she also dated Miles Morales. Oh, my. <laughs> so, but I like the character. I don't know what they're going to do about the fact that she's now leaving her entire universe behind. Sorry, Dad, I will never see you again. I'm going to a different universe where I died. That to me the other day. <sighs> but on the next page is Spider-Man Shadow of the Green Goblin by J.M.D. Matthias. This is set in the real early stages of Spider-Man before Norman Osborn was the Green Goblin. So we're getting a continuity implant during the Ditko era. And normally I would say, this is bullshit, but it's J.M.D. Matias who is excellent at these things. So I'm willing to give it a try. If you are a fall of the X-Men guy, you're gonna wanna go to page 34 and 35 because the Avengers are getting involved. And I was waiting for him. I mean, you know, Tony Stark is pretty PO'd because they stole his technology and made those iron sentinels to go against the X-Men. Well, the Avengers, they've hung in space. A sort of Damocles over Orcus for too long, but now knowing they had only one chance to strike, they waited while Iron Man prepared. Now on his signal, it is time and the Avengers only know one way to strike hard so it, look again i'm all this fall of x i'm just waiting for an omnibus because it was just too much and too many issues and <laughs> ugh. but i'm i mean it, the what i've read i'm very excited about it. and i just again i point that out because if you're not iron man's been part of it from the beginning but if you haven't been picking up avengers you definitely want to pick these two up especially if you've been following what's going on with the fall of X. On um, page 45 is our next giant size. It's giant size Hulk number one by the writer who's doing the Hulk now, Philip Kennedy Johnson. Riding the rails is no walk in the park, especially for the Incredible Hulk, particularly when something, no, someone has been stolen from him by a gruesome new threat who's evil with evil machinations in mind. I like the giant size books in the 70s, I have such fond memories for. And I even like when Marvel would do that sort of thing. Joe, do you remember the 100 page monster issues? Yes. I loved those, even though they were more than half reprint. Loved them. I love a big package of comics. And while this is just 48 pages with a reprint in the back, I, I still. You know, nostalgia is going to win. Then we get to our facsimile editions, Joe. Yep, you're on page 46. They've got Amazing Spider-Man 255, Marvel Secret Su Superhero Secret Wars 4. I think you're right, Corey. They're going to reprint the whole thing. And then one I may do, X-Men 130 facsimile edition. Why is this one getting all the heat? Well, there's a persistent rumor. First of all, it's the first appearance of Dazzler. It's during the classic Chris Claremont, John Byrne run. And there's a certain someone who they think might be tapped for a Marvel movie, although it's probably just fanboy hearsay. But we're talking, of course, Taylor Swift. Oh, did you see that, Corey? The, the downloads for our podcast just went up just by mentioning her name. <laughs> I, I say that tongue-in-cheek because I just picked up Femforce through Tidal Wave Production. 
has a whole line of these Taylor Swift comics that you got to buy for their website because they're probably not going to make it to any previews catalog. And I went and I bought two because of the artists. They had a whole line of them. I picked up the one from Al Gazera and have you seen it? Sora Sung? Oh, I didn't know Sora did one. Yeah. And they have the variant covers and then the virgin covers and then the the there might be nudie covers. I don't I don't think there's nudie covers, but foil covers and whatever. So again, a lot of if if you can afford to go out and find yourself a few uncanny X-Men 130s, do it. Here's your next best chance. And I point at the heat from the original reprints before they call them facsimile editions of Hulk 181 because they almost go up. So, and it's a fun story. Keep in mind it is reprint, it does continue into 131. Uh, what was her second appearance? Was it Amazing Spider Man? Yeah. So, there you go. Amazing Spider Man 202, right? Yep. No. 203. It was around there. Yeah, because yeah, that's right. Because two issue two hundred one and two hundred two was a two parter. With then Punisher. they had Dazzler show up. Yeah, so pick up th pick up that one, and after that, Dazzler number one, which has already been going up in price because it's a number one, and it was actually, if I if I recall right, Dazzler number one was the first Marvel direct market comic ever. Full painted cover, no UPC code on it. Uh, you know, of course, we bought tons of them, and it was mm, moderate reading. So was, here's it, your chance, it, baby. Pick up them Dazzler back issues. I am picking this up for one reason and one reason alone, Joe. Which is? They have a foil cover. Now oh. take a look at that cover. Yes. Foil on that is going to look amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because yeah, it's... Uh, Drawn by John Romita Jr. I did not realize that Byrne did not draw that back in the day. But they use this wonderful light effect on the cover that is going to just be amazing as a foil cover. So that's one. It's like that Ghost Rider Glow in the Dark issue number 15. Mm -hmm. I remember I picked it up. I didn't much care for Ghost Rider the, the Ghost Rider book back then, but it's like, that's cool. And then you told me that up at which comic shop was it had it in the bathroom on the wall? Oh, Granite City. He put yeah. all his glow-in-the-darks in the bathroom. <laughs> Which is great, because you get in there and you're like, turn off the light and turn around. You're like, what? Click. Boom. <laughs> so, the rest are regular series with not a lot different in them. I do want to point out, because I like pointing out stuff that will make you mad. All of the Star Wars comics, except for Mace Window, are now $4.99 for 32 pages. So enjoy that. Enjoy that. <laughs> and then we get to where Corey's money goes. Yep, yep. And I'm just going to sit back. I got one thing I'm, I'm going to buy, but I like to just listen because occasionally you'll point something out that I, I may have missed. Well, the cross-gen reprinting continues as they are reprinting putting oh, mystic so yeah in an omnibus this was written by ron mars tony bedard barbara kessel the main artists on it were brandon peterson steve mcniven but there was also kevin sharp um al rio aaron lepresky paul ryan paul pelletier george perez does a story in the cross young chronicles and claudio castanelli the what was the first one they did well, whatever the first cross-gen one they did must have sold well enough. Sigil. Sigil must have sold well enough that now they're doing Mystic. I'm waiting for Ruse, which was a weird Sherlock Holmesian type series written by Mark Wade. But the cross-gen stuff, the now I know they did a Marvel Tales, which was kind of a cross-gen sampler. From what I've heard, the sales on that were disappointing. But the Omnibus did around the same as kind of a midline Marvel omnibus. So while they're not looking to bring the characters back, they are going to be doing omnibuses because those actually make enough money to make it worthwhile. On the next page is a book I'm not getting because I didn't like it when it came out, but a lot of people did and with the issues that they're reprinting were crazy hot. 
the 90s Ghost Rider, Ghost Rider Danny Ketch Omnibus Volume 1 with the Mark Texaria cover. By the way, that Mark Texaria cover is the cover for issue 15. So when you look at it, you go, oh, all the flames were the glow in the dark. This reprints issues 1 through 24 of Ghost Rider, as well as all the tie-ins. And boy, that the book went crazy. I remember the book went crazy. And it was part of a thing where Marvel did a new number one, January, February, March, April, May, June. And they kind of dropped this one out and didn't. It was, you know, a first issue, but they didn't think it was going to be huge. And there was just so much pent up demand and the art by Texaria was something that people wanted. So boom, it sold like crazy. The next new omnibus is another one I'm not picking up and that is Excalibur Omnibus Volume 3. This reprints Excalibur 68 through 103. In my mind, once Alan Davis left Excalibur, it lost a lot of its charm and it became just another 90s X-Men book. And when you look at the writers, you'll see Scott Lodell, Evan Skolnick, uh, Chris Cooper, Todd DeZago, Fabian Neasasia. There is a nice little run in there by Warren Ellis when Warren Ellis was just a wee baby and not Warren, the Warren Ellis we know. On the next page is one that I'm picking up because I didn't have the money when it first came out. They are reprinting it. Finally, Avengers by Busick and Perez, Volume 2. This reprints the end of the Busick and Perez run. It also has art by Alan Davis, Jerry Ordway, Bruce Tim, John Romita Jr., Brent Anderson, Norm Bifocal, uh, Richard Howell, Manuel Garcia, Stuart Eminen, Mark Bagley, hot artist. If you don't have volume one, get that because when these go out of print, they go up in price rapidly. This yeah, was this is my just like, favorite it, Avengers. This run. is just like uh hitman for me i spent i've got them all in comic book form do i want to replace them all <sighs> i gotta win that lottery damn it they're also reprinting invincible iron man omnibus volumes two and three if you're an iron man fan you'll want these i find most of the iron man stories before david michelini to be mediocre at best so your mileage may vary Extreme X-Men by Chris Claremont, Omnibus Volume 2, completes his run, as well as has the uh, X-Women and X-Men Unlimited stories that tie into it. This was the book they gave Chris Claremont when he came back from DC, where he got to write his favorite X-Men characters. On the next page, I was surprised this was not printed much, much earlier. This is Ultimate Spider-Man Omnibus Volume 4, because Volumes 1 through 3 have been around forever, but I'm shocked they, that Volume 4 has taken so long. This reprints the last stories of Peter Parker as the Ultimate Spider-Man and does lead up to the death of Peter Parker. And... Remember when they got near the end of the run and Peter Parker came back and he was going to try and figure out how he came back to life? And, it, well, the Ultimate Universe went away and we never found out. <laughs> Masterwork-wise, we have Fantastic Four Volume 26, which is the end of the John Byrne run. There will be another omnibus that has his last few stories, but this is when they brought back the Phoenix. And pretty much at this point, in my mind, John Byrne had lost interest. So the book became kind of mediocre and dull at this point. Does have the Avengers Annual, which ties up these three scrolls that were made into cows that had already been tied up back in the Kree Scroll War. And mm. the Marvel graphic novel of She-Hulk by John Byrne. Then the next thing I am picking up, the Epic Collections, Iron Man Modern Era Epic Collection, World's Most Wanted. This is volume three in the Iron Man Modern Era Epic Collection. So I don't know what will be volumes one and two, but this is the first part of the Matt Fraction Salvador La Roca run. This is Invincible Iron Man one through 19. So Iron Man, this is when Iron Man became the new director of S.H.I.E.L.D. 
right after the Skull Scroll Secret Invasion. So I really like this run. I love Matt Fraction's work on superheroes. And Joe, do you know why Matt Fraction's not doing any uh, comic books currently? I thought he won the lottery. Uh, pretty much. The Godzilla series that is on Apple TV, he's the showrunner of that. Ah. <laughs> We also have a lot of epic reprints. They reprint uh, Bucky Reborn, which was volume three of Captain America. This was Captain America 120 through 138. Stan Lee and Gene Colan. Avengers Epic Collection volume one, which is the first 20 issues of the Avengers. Then on the next page, the worst Avengers story ever told. <laughs> the crossing? No, this is worse. Oh, I, okay. Avengers Epic Collection, The Evil Reborn, which reprints the infamous Avengers 200. Oh. Thankfully, it also reprints Avengers Annual Number 10, where Chris Claremont kind of went in and went, no! He smacked everybody in the face with a newspaper saying, do not rape Ms. Marvel and call it romantic. Stop Bad it! Bad Avengers. Bad Avengers. Bad Jim Shooter. Oh. I, st I can't even go back and read that story anymore. I remember at the time being pissed off that it was, you've built all this up and it's this and it's weird and it gets rid of the character and I don't feel good reading it. But I didn't know why it didn't feel good. And then Chris Claremont's Avengers Annual 10 came out and pointed out all the super creepy shit in it. And it's like, oh, okay. That's why it felt icky reading it. And that was my first Avenger book. Oh. What did I know? I like George Press. Yeah. On the next page, we get more reprints, Joe. Hey. Uh, Star Wars Legends Epic Collection, The Old Republic Volume 1. This is, whatever it says Star Wars Legends, that's the stuff from Before the Purge. Mm. <laughs> Where they said, yeah, all that stuff that was done that filled in on the con all the continuity. Yeah, we're going to do new movies now, and we can't be bothered to fit in these thousands of comics books video games whatever we're just we're going to if, if it's not a movie it doesn't count and then if it's not a tv show it doesn't count and the thing is every other media property treats the tie-in novels as if they except babylon 5 you told me there's one babylon 5 novel which kind of is important for continuity's sake but it's like the star trek books they don't exist in continuity. They're just tie-ins. The, the people who make the movies, they, they're not going to read them. They're not going to bother with them. And it's the same for all the Star, Star Wars comics. Under that is Spider-Man Assassination Nation. This was the end. Uh, this was the bulk of the Todd McFarlane run going into Eric Larson taking over. Yep. I'm but on the, but on the this next This one page, I may pick up and then on the next page. The I'm one on the next page is the one in our wheelhouse. Yeah. I started reading Amazing Spider-Man two issues before this with Amazing Spider-Man 163. This has Amazing Spider-Man 178, which was your first issue, yeah. all the way up to 185. Yeah. So I'm, again, there's a lot of graphic novels, not only from, well, DC's got one omnibus. But as we get through, you're going to hear there's a lot of graphic novels I'm interested in this month. So once I get everything loaded, I'll have to decide, do I want to pick this up now or wait? Because, again, my goal is to replace my so what, the essentials with epics and get them yeah. in color. <sighs> I got I to gotta go win that lottery, I'm telling you. Uh, two more reprints of Epic Collections. See, don't pay stupid money for Epic Collections. They will reprint them. Uh, Daredevil, Daredevil Epic Collection Fall from Grace. This is number 18. This is when Daredevil got armor. Which I... Oh, you know how I can hear things better and and um, I can use my power of touch to... blah blah. Well, I'm going to cover up my ears with armor and cover my hands with armor so that neither... Whatever. Um, then X-Men Epic Collection, The Gift, which has the X-Men story that I hate more than any other. Really? Yep. This is Uncanny X-Men 189 to 198. 
the Kulan Goth story. I hate that story so much. Is that the imaginary where all yeah. the world changed? I, I enjoy it just because it was kind of its own little thing. And I of get course, that, when, but when the was, characters started dying, I realized, okay, the imaginary. Yeah, it was torture porn. We get five pages of Spider Man being strung up and cut with knives. Ah, I didn't read yeah. I didn't read it that harsh. I thought seeing again, this guy was a bastard ass in Conan. You know, what do you expect? These guys come to the to the future and they're like, Oh well, we're gonna be nice and dandy. No, there's a reason why these guys suck. There's a reason why we cheer when Conan runs a sword through his head. What to me to join you on the oh, that's so annoying. The fact that Captain America remembered it and said, I will never forget this. Although later yeah, he on, forgot it. He, yeah, he forgot. So. He forgot because Kulan Goth was no longer available to Marvel. Well, just that, you know, that, <laughs> just that the X-Men saved the world, even though no one else remembers. <sighs> but uh, anyway, I will remember this until we lose right, the rights to the villain. Yeah. <laughs> On the next page is the Thor epic collection, The Lost Gods, which was Journey into Mystery 503 versus 5213. This was the story where they just kind of ran in place. Asgard was destroyed and Thor wasn't selling well. So they did a story where Asgard was destroyed and the gods had to um, see. Asgard has been destroyed. The gods are scattered across the earth, living mortal lives with no memory of their past selves, which is a story that has been way goddamn overdone because they did it in Thor two times since then. And then I love Neil Gaiman, but Neil Gaiman did it with the Eternals too. It once is fine. By the fourth time you're doing the story, an editor needs to tap you on the shoulder and say, we done did that. Done. It's been done. Now, <sighs> one of the last epic collection I want to point out. Joe, remember the Planet of the Apes omnibus that was 224 pages for yes. $125? Well, here's the epic collection of the exact same thing for $34.99. Yeah, I'm, I, again, another one. Another one I'm tempted but it's 11 I have, issues. They did I have, yeah, I have the original issues. issues. <laughs> now, here's the thing. This is a reprint of the stories they did in the black and white magazine that they then reprinted in terrible color. I don't know if they're going to go back and recolor them, but I remember I picked up Adventures on the Planet of the Apes number 11. And it looked like someone had spilled paint all over all the pages. You hmm. could make heads or tails out of the art because the art had been drawn larger size for black and white. And when they covered it, it's, you know, all the feathering that the Filipino artists would do because it's black and white and you do the feathering to give it layers. Nope. There. It's all, it's green. <laughs> you can't see any of that ink. It, nope. It's green. So the the artist who drew all the leaves, fuck you! It's a big green blob. Now I will I will mention though, because Disney slash Fox slash Marvel has the rights to Planet of the Apes. This is one that might go out of print because nobody cares. Again, might want to pick it up if you're so inclined because it may never, or it may go up in price so crazy. Marvel go, hey, we should reprint this again. So. Whatever. I, I think they'll drag Planet of the Apes out whenever there's a new movie. Because I'm pointing out all the shitty things this month. On page 114 is the uh, Spider-Man reign, which is where Mary Jane dies because of Peter Parker's radioactive sperm. I have shocked Joe into silence. Did you ever read that story? I did. Oh, they wanted it to be Spider-Man's Dark Knight, and instead it was just dark yeah <laughs> but on the next page black willow by kelly thompson it reprints that entire run which was a really fun run and j scott campbell story i'm sorry the j scott campbell cover is really pretty but that's not a normal human by any stretch of the imagination <laughs> ah. And then on the next page is another 
Turkey. Civil War II, the book that pretty much killed the fan love for Bendis is being reprinted. So there you go, kids. There's your Marvel. Yeah, a damning endorsement if there ever was one. All right. <laughs> now. Uh, I, you know, that Joe, I don't know if I've talked about it here on the podcast. I am putting together a book. And Joe, you've seen all those books of you know, 100 movies to see before you die, 100 books to read before you die. Uh, Tony Isabella did 1,000 comics to read before you die. I'm doing a book, 1,000, 100 comics to die before you read, oh. where I point out shitty comics. Civil War II is going to be in that book. Spider-Man Reign is going to be in that book. Uh, the first story that I've uh, I've written up a few, but the first one I wrote up, Skate Man number one. Hmm. <laughs> How many of those did you buy? I don't think I bought any. You've never bought read it. Skate Man number one? I didn't say Neil I didn't Adams? read it because I found him in dollar bins and stuff. Oh, yeah. Oof. But previews. Yay. On the front cover, Disney's Hercules. So Dynamite is getting all of the uh, Disney kid-friendly stuff. It used to be that Dark Horse was doing it. It looks like Dynamite has taken over that. Now, I look at this cover, and this does not look like the Hercules movie to me. Actually, it looks more like young Hercules. Yeah. But we'll, 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 when we get closer to it, I'll talk about it when we talk about Diamond. On the back cover is a book that whenever I hear about it, reminds me of Big Mike. She is back. Crusade Comics returns to comic shops. Mm -hmm. She, number one, 30th anniversary, original art edition. Now, if you've been paying attention to his Kickstarter, that's where you had a chance to get it ahead of time. And what I found a lot of times is once they finish the Kickstarter, they solicit in Diamond to either sell the rest off or just finalize the print run so if you really are a she fan go jump on board on this kickstarter and you get all the fun stuff and the autographs and the, the coins and the patches and the swag and then on the spine are the teenage mutant ninja turtles mini mites Ooh. mini mates i like my mites. The Party Wagon Deluxe Box Set. Hmm. So there we go. All right. There is a listing of all of the free comic book day stuff again. Yep. Because this is for May, which is when free comic book day is. So we'll start out. The first publisher in the book is Boom. Corey, do you have anything from Boom? I do not think I do. All right. Let me rattle through I what I do I've... not. I have nothing I'll rattle new off from what I will show off for boom i like on page 48 blown away five issue miniseries zach thompson nicola Izzo, unyielding wildlife photographer i think it's brianna brigatang whatever isolates she's isolated in the remote cold of Bethlehem island she sees something she can't unsee an argument followed by an outburst of vi intense violence between two nearby climbers did she just witness a murder? In frantic search for the truth, she discovers just what she's looking for, but little does she know that more of the white silent of winter is keeping her company. Sorry, I said that wrong. More than the silent white of winter is keeping her company. So that, that caught my eye. If you're a Labyrinth fan, they're doing an archive edition where the Three issues that originally was done by Sid Jacobson, John Buscema, and R Romeo Tang Hao. This was the 1986 classic Marvel Comics adaptation. So they're doing an archive edition, which I think is a brilliant idea. You can get the original cover or you can get one of the other variant covers. And shall I can point out buy my it one this way, problem with that? Or you can buy it probably find the back issues you know it was a marvel super special too wasn't it yep that's yep. what i was going to point out 
why don't they just reprint the Marvel Super Special rather than the comic that reprinted the Marvel Super Special? It's coming. Mm. It's more fun to do archive editions. Besides, this is the first one I'm aware of that Boom's doing other than one that they haven't done themselves. I talked about this in the last podcast, but if you jump to page where are we? Oh, we're all of 60, 61. This is the book. I read a number one that I picked up for 50 cents from Dreamer's Vault in town. 50 cents. Now, now it's coming out. I picked up book one, and now they're coming out with the deluxe edition, the slipcase edition, or I could just go buy volume two and get the story. But apparently it is continuing on because, again, the, the first ones I think only cover – 12 issues and here they're up to issue 16 and then if I jump onto the deluxe hardcover it covers 1 through 15 so I may be doing that I may do the slipcase edition but fantastic book I absolutely loved it when I read it and that's it for boom next up dynamite in case you folks aren't guessing we are doing a really bad Jimmy Walker impersonation so go back to your 1970s cliches and check it out, kids. By the way, so, he's still on tour and playing at the Chuckle Hut in a small town somewhere nowhere near you. And but you'll he see is him, still on tour. You'll see him briefly at the beginning of Airplane, which was really funny because he was like one of the biggest stars at the time. And all he did was lift the hood of the airplane while the pilots were talking, check the oil try to shut it, jump on it, and end up falling to his death. So, <laughs> on page 86 is the aforementioned Hercules, and I'm going to read through it. He's the world's famous demigod turned mortal. He's back and about to embark on the biggest adventure since, biggest adventure since the Odyssey. And this apparently must have happened after the movie, because Herc chose a mortal life over the opportunity to join him on Mount Olympus. But since Herc has proven his mettle as a hero many times over, the gods of Olympus are happy to enlist his help with missions that require intervention in the earthly realm. So, again, if, if you like it, go for it. It's there. You get a, a couple interviews with it. Actually, wow, one, two, three, four pages. So that's pretty cool. If you're a Red Sonja fan, Empire of the Dam starts right on page 94. Again, all the variant covers are listed, all the fun stuff. You get an interview on the next couple of pages along with some art. If you really like Red Sonja, go to page 136 because there is the Red Sonja. How do you say it? I Kana Hakania Legacy Board Game. So impress your friends. It's a modular adventure board game for one to four players, expandable up to six. So there must be expansion stuff available. Also on that page, you've got a uh, exclusive Sheena Queen of the Jungle variant. On the page after, you've got all the offered again graphic novels. I will definitely point out. Red Sonia and Vampirella meet Betty and Veronica, Volume 1. The whole kit and caboodle in one. I absolutely love this series. And again, I have no idea what I have, if I have it all in one or not, but I'll probably be by the trade paperback. Amy Chu, Mario Sanapal. It's just a blast. They did really well with the materials. And I think that's it, Dynamite. Corey, did you have anything? I did not. Nothing new. All right. On to Image. And since I've been talking a bit, Corey, what's the first thing from Image on your mind? Page 139, we are, we've are we had a few issues and a few series, but now it looks like that Jeff Johns has finally hit go on his superhero universe. Geiger number one, which is an ongoing series featuring the character Geiger. And then under that is a series Redcoat number one. Now, Geiger is drawn by Gary Frank. Red Coat is drawn by Brian Hitch. So it's not like he's not pulling out the big guns for this. And out of all of them, I think the one that caught my attention is Rook, yep. which is on the same page because it's a science fiction series 
takes place a hundred years from now. The man known as Rook was once a simple farmer who fled the crumbling earth for new life on the planet Exodus, a terraformed planet where all of nature, including its imported animal population, was completely controlled by humans called wardens. But when Exodus world engine failed, the warden's power fell into the wrong hands, creating chaos, mass evacuations for those who could afford it. The rest, like Rook, must scavenge for an escape vessel as the war for control of what's left begins. So yeah, it, it, I'm on board. I'm, I've got the first run of Geiger, haven't read it. Don't know if I want to jump into the next one, but they'll be in trades. So I, I have really enjoyed the stuff that he's doing over at Image, but then I've always really liked Jeff Johns's writing. I, I think he was perfectly suited for DC because he was a guy who did a great job of building up the idea of legacies where you know, these heroes then led into these heroes and there is a long history. But here he's kind of creating his whole universe from scratch and bringing in the big name artists. So I'm on board, ladies and gentlemen. He's on board, nobody ladies cares. and gentlemen. I'm sure nobody cares. On page 141 is a book that, if I knew it was coming out, oh. I would have bought a bunch of other books. <laughs> yeah, and this is one I tried to order when it first was solicited back in October 23, and it wasn't available. Well, now I know why it's coming out now. So, but can you tell, is this everything? I mean, the, the everything that, to date? No. Oh. This is an omnibus of Astro City. There will be at least one more and probably two more okay. omnibuses that collect everything. But this is the first miniseries, the second series, and a bunch of the one-shots, as well as another miniseries. But it's 1,168 pages of Astro City by Kurt Busick and Brent Anderson. If you liked Marbles... This is that same sort of storytelling style where it's superhero stories, but it's not the superheroes. It's about everything around the superheroes, the yeah. normal people, the cops, the police, the um, firemen, the, the people who get rescued. It's a different way of telling superhero stories. And one of the things about it is Kurt Busiek says that this one is the hardest work he does as a writer and when you read it you can see why because he's always looking for a new angle a kind of a new way in and when you're constantly doing that you there it's it's more work but when you read it it's so worth it if you're a superhero fan, this is kind of like a top tier superhero book, even though these are characters that have been created for this universe. It really has heart and soul. And Brent Anderson is in that John Buscema, Brune Hogarth style of art where he wants the people to look anatomically correct for what they're doing. Really great stuff. And I have been buying the Metro books, which are trade paper, big, thick paperback reprints that are about as big as a Marvel Epic collection. And then they are coming out with an omnibus. So it's one of those where you go, holy crap. And I'm surprised at you, Corey. You didn't say the best part about Astro City. What's that? Well, it, it holds up to rereading. Oh, yeah. Because the fun thing is, is he's dropping hints all over the place that you'll either forget about or you'll you'll go back and reread and you go, oh, wow. And so pay unlike, attention, folks. And unlike a lot of 90s superhero books, it has not aged. No. Because he's looking at superheroes from different angles and Brett Anderson's art is in that classic style. I, I want you guys... To go back to page 140, because we've just gone on 10 minutes about something that's been in print for a long time. Here's a bunch of number ones. Everything on page 140 sounds interesting. 1774 AD number one. It's a series premiere. First time in newsprint from the fevered brain and drawing desk of T.P. Luis and Ashley Wood comes an all new ongoing series collecting bits and bobs from Ash's storied career. Up first, Full two length tales. This is where image. I really, really miss the preview art. 
This looks interesting. I, at $4.99, I don't want to jump on board without. And again, I know I can probably look online and find this shit. But, you know, I'm a I'm a previews guy. Again, underneath it, drawing blood number one. Kevin Eastman's back. He returns with a look into roller coaster life of a successful comic creator. When you create a global franchise before you turn 20, what happens next? Do you think he would know? Welcome to the world of Shane Bookman, a cartoonist whose real life has become more absurd than any comic book. 12 issues. Okay, I'm waiting for the I'm waiting for the book on this one. Okay. I mean, if you're a hack and slash fan, there's a hack and slash up above that's been resolicited from I don't resolicited from this month? Whatever. It's there. Underneath it, Rat City with a sneaky to be revealed cover. It's an extra length first issue of Rat Cities. Finally arrived. Peter Carnes, an ex-soldier, amputee, and a hell spawn. That's what I wanted to point out. If you're a spawn person, this ties into spawn. And of course, if you didn't read the logo and just ignored the black cover in the Rat City, you wouldn't catch any of that. And underneath it, one, two, three, four, five. That's it's beyond a grand slam, isn't it? But yeah, St. Mercy Godland four issue series. Mercy Mercedes Oro now finds herself immortal. In addition to protecting her cursed ancient Incan gold throughout the years, she struggled constantly with gods who see her as both a threat and an opportunity. Now she has both a spirit inside her and her demon sister besides her. Mercy finds herself in a golden age surrounded by different gods in the 1930s Hollywood. But will her star power be enough to hold the past at bay or will Mercy find herself in the bloody center of a conflict between the gods of old and the gods of the silver screen? I fumbled there a bit because I did not try to pronounce the god's name. I don't need any more bad luck. Right above Astro City, if you're so inclined, Universal Monsters, Creature from the Black Lagoon, four-issue series. I think they're going to vi- revisit all these things. So, yeah, a lot of good stuff. I mean, this is actually a first for us, Corey. I think every single number one that Image has coming out, we're we're recommended. Yeah. Good job, Image. And then on the next page is a book that I missed as a regular series, and I'm kicking myself. Uh-oh. The Enfield Gang Massacre by Chris Corden yes. and Jake, Jacob Phillips. This is the dark origin of that Texas Bloods, Ambrose County. Montgomery Enfield and his gang of outlaws find themselves in the crosshairs of an aging Texas Ranger in a newborn county that's hungry for law by any means necessary. I must have passed over this at some point, but that Texas Blood is my favorite image comic running. It's so damn good. And then Chris Condon also did a wrestling comic a while back that I gave Butch. So he's a writer who has gone on my list of, yeah, I buy anything he does. So with this one being kind of a flashback to for that Texas blood, I, I, I am all over this. Joe, any trade paperbacks that jump out at you? The two hardcovers there. You got the, the Little Monster Deluxe hardcover. Last children on earth they just happen to be vampires i point that out because i know i recommended this when it came out here it is in hardcover form underneath it is mirka and dolfolo's hot paprika omnibus i've been buying that as a series it's fun fabulous it's beautiful it's funny here's your chance buy it as a buy it as an omnibus get it all at once so that's it for me Emmett. well wait a minute Page 143, something called Schlub. The Schlub. Again, another series I recommended when it came out. This is a guy who is a, a failing dentist. Roger Delton blames the world for his problems till he's body swapped with the world's greatest superheroes. What will he finally do? Again, I recommended it when it came out as a series. Here it is in a trade. And that's it for me, image wise. Yep, because the rest of Image is their ongoing series. Mm hmm. Next up is Titan Comics. Joe, do you have anything in Titan Comics? I The only thing I have is on page 166. And it's basically they're doing the Michael Moorcock's library. 
the making of a sorcerer. And they have all sorts of offered again. If you actually grab the previews custom order book, they have every single book that's available in the library to reorder. And I think, Corey, this is where we fell. Remember back when, when they had that retailers order the Judge Dredd series om omnibus? Yeah. They were in the order book, not necessarily in the order form. So you could have gone and given the, the diamond codes to your retailer and they could order them. So again, we don't order the previews custom order book because we don't use it. I get it as part of my order because I, I buy them full price at the source now instead of getting a discounted price and they include this with it. So it's, it's just one of those things. If you ever see that offered again, it's probably in the order book, not necessarily on your order form. So just dig a little and you should be, I mean, I'm talking there's, there's at least 20, if not 25 of the Michael Moorcox library. And again, some of them are hard covers, some of them are soft covers, but it's there. And, and that's this it. Is a, this is a reprint, Joe. Mm -hmm. Do you know what it is a reprint from? I think wasn't, no, Eclipse did them for a while. This is actually from DC. Oh, really? Uh, oh. They did under the Helix brand, mm -hmm. Michael Moorcock's Multiverse, which had Walt Simonson doing. What it was, there were three stories that went through the 12 issues. The first was Walt Simonson, Moonbeams and Roses. Mark Reeves did the Metatemporal Detective, and John Ridgway did Duke Elric. Moonbeams and Roses is set in the Terminal Cafe. That is what Walt Simonson stuff. So they are splitting up the Walt Simonson. They are splitting up the Michael Moorcock's multiverse into, th I would guess, three different books. But if you go a few pages back, they are reprinting the Conan the Barbarian original comics omnibus volume two and Savage Sword of Conan original comics omnibus volume two. Now, they still have not shipped Savage Sword of Conan omnibus number nine, which was the first omnibus that they listed, but now they are reprinting the older omnibuses. They are saying that these, these are remastered. So they're probably going back and doing color correction on the Conan the Barbarian because those were in color. Savage Sword, I don't know what they could remaster because, oh my God, those Marvel books were beautiful and didn't need a lot of work. And I think that was it for me for Titan. All right. Now on to the deluxe publishers. I, my first one is on page 182. I do want to point out Aftershock, still not printing new stuff down to two pages, nah, 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 nah. but they're down to two pages. Yep. So their so money is starting out. to run out. Yep. So pick them up while you can. Let's see. Page 182, the library mule of Cordoba. It's a fable of what happens when saving the world's books from destruction depends on the worst mule in history. Basically, the library, it's, it's, there was a period of peace, culture, science for 60 years. And then one of his visors seizes the opportunity to take power. He's a radical clergyman in exchange for their support of the illegitimate pretender. They want to see the 400,000 books of Cordoba's library burn. The night before the biggest bonfire ever, the head librarian, a chubby eunuch named Tarid, gathers up all the books he can, loads them onto the back of a passing mule, takes off in hopes of saving what he can, of the universal knowledge. Joined by a young scribe and a former apprentice who went on to become a thief and a vagabond, Tarid, his lazy overburdened mule, and the young scribe set out on a madcap adventure, crossing nearly all of Spain with mercenaries in hot pursuit. Again, this is a little more expensive hardcover, 25 bucks, but it sounds interesting. Do you have anything else in a blaze, Corey? I do not, but I do want to point out that they have done a packet of the Sumerian. 
the yes. collectible virgin cover pack. Don't, These don't, are don't, the. No, no, don't point out. It's limited to 500, and I want to get about 500 of them. So don't, <laughs> don't. It's on 183. Totally ignore it. Totally. Because it's every virgin cover pack available. So shh, shh, quiet. And this is the Conan <laughs> stories that they published. And it's a bonus I, one you can only get in this set. Shh, shh, quiet. And I also I, figured out the loophole that they use. What it is over in Europe. Robert E. Howard's Conan stuff is public domain, so they can publish it over there. It's public domain and then bring it to the U.S. However, they have worked out a licensing agreement to so that they don't get in trouble when they sell it in the U.S. Because I thought that was really weird. No, I, I didn't have anything from a blaze. Nope. The next one's not till Dark Horse. So that's yep, uh, same uh, here. Nothing from Massive, whatnot. Zen scope. So let's jump right in. Page 208. The Butcher Boy number one. Deep within the back roads of the Pacific Northwest, an entire town fell victim to the brutal cleaver of the Butcher of La Perdita. But that was more than 100 years ago. And in that time, generational nightmares of murder and meat have been reduced to a morbid clickbait folklore. <laughs> Oi, I, I give kudos to whoever's writing this crap because you ain't making it easy on my tongue. <sighs> Anyways, it's just for board travelers to share online. And yet, some say that the butcher still haunts the streets at night seeking fresh meat for his lauder. A true Lovecraftian horror or just the fevered dreams of a mentally unstable serial killer. Six friends on a road trip are about to find out. What do you got if for us, Corey? If you go to page 214, this is going to be uh, eating my wallet. Two I'm not getting, though. Um, EC Archives, Crime Suspense Stories, the EC Archives are back. Crime Suspense Stories, Volume 2. I know everybody loves the horror. I know EC was proudest of their science fiction. The older I get, the more I just absolutely love the crime stuff. Johnny Craig was at his peak doing this. These are twist ending crime stories. And I read a lot of crime comics now that uh, so many of them have been printed by our friends over at Guandana Land. But man, I have yet to find anything that even comes close to how good the EC crime comics were. Also, you have uh, Eerie Archives, Volume 6. This is after the stories had taken a step down, but you do get a whole bunch of Doug Mensch real early in his career. And I'm going to tell the Jim Storer and Doug Mensch story. Jim Warren was a guy who, if you worked for him and then worked for anybody else, he would hate you because he saw every competition as taking food off his plate. Well, Doug Mensch would send in stories and Warren would only buy one per issue. So all of a sudden, some of his competitors over at Skywald and Marvel are starting to, you know, in their horror magazines, have Doug Mensch stories. So he calls Mensch, who lived in Chicago at the time, and just balls him out. And Mensch says, well, you're only buying one story a month for me. I can't pay rent on that. So I have to sell to other people. And Warren says, well, then send me the stories. And that's how Doug Mensch started doing a ton of stories for Warren <laughs> because he figured out how to get James Warren pissed enough to buy more <laughs> stories. Oh, by the Under way, that, that, that doesn't work with Corey. He so won't take my podcast. I, You haven't sent a solo podcast in years. Yeah, I can't stop changing your address. You, you're the one handing out keys to the house. Come on, come on. I ran out of those. Nobody cares. Grendel Omnibus Volume 6. It's a reprint still. Madman Library Edition Volume 6. This reprints super early stuff from Mike Allred, such as Graphic Music 1 through 4, which I have. Graphic Music 1 through 3, which I also have, Madman in Your Face 3D Special, and Mr. Gum, Who Sell Out, You Sell Out, as well as his latest creator-owned series, X-Ray Omnibus, 520 pages in a hardcover for $100. And that, for me, is all I have from Dark Horse. 
two properties I'll point out for Dark Horse with number ones. If you're a Masters of the Universe fan, go to page 211. Masters of the Universe Revolution 1. If you're a Witcher fan, go to page 213, The Witcher. Corvo Bianco. And that's it for me. And now IDW. IDW. You got anything, IDW? On page 218 is Godzilla, Here There Be Monsters, which, oh, oh yeah. I'm sorry. No, it's the one under that, Godzilla Library Collection, Volume 2, which reprints the Eric Powell mini 12-issue series, Kingdom of Monsters, by oh, yeah. Eric Powell and Phil Hester. 304 pages, $29.99. These are kind of putting together all the Godzilla stuff that IDW has done over the years, which they should have done a long time ago. Yeah, above that's a Godzilla Mechazilla 50th anniversary one shot. I like the one shots. So this is basically an intrepid reporter profiles the history of Mechagodzilla and its creator before the launch of the newest model. And he finds himself entangled in a much deeper conspiracy, a decade spanning adventure celebrating the mechanical monsters milestone. On page 219, a new my Little Pony, for you My Little Pony fans, set your sail. And that's it for me. And now we get to the rest of the books. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right away on page, where are we? Page 223 under Abrams Comic Art. Kent State, Four Dead in Ohio graphic novel. On May 4th, 1970, the Ohio National Guard gunned down unarmed college students protesting the Vietnam War at Kent State University. This is a historical fact, folks. In a deadly barrage of 67 shots, four students were killed, nine shot and wounded. It was the day America turned guns on its own children. A shocking event burned into our national memory. History, to borrow a phrase from someone on YouTube, deserves to be remembered. This graphic novel has been resolicited and if you had all are interested in what's happened in the past, this is it. Hate to start out heavy, but sometimes some of these graphic novels are deadly serious stuff. Corey, what do you got for us first off? On that same page, Cerebus in Hell presents a Kimbo one shot. Now, I don't normally point out the Cerebus in Hell, but this is the first one drawn by Dave Sim. His wrist has healed enough that he is drawing again. So his first complete issue, solo illustrated work since Glamour Post number 26. He is doing a parody of manga. I also want to point out the Cerebus in Hell that was the Miracle Man parody is probably the best thing Dave Sim has done since Juden Haas. While it's not as serious and deep and dark as Juden Haas, it is a creator from a creator own standpoint the history of miracle man and the people who got screwed along the way and it's got a lot of insider information a lot of the stuff that has been rumored about but never said out loud a lot of stuff from when eclipse went under and todd mcfarland bought it it was just fascinating you do have to remember that it's filtered through Dave Sims' mind. I love Dave Sims' work at times. There are also times when I find his work unreadable, and there are times when I find his look at the world to be misogynistic. But his going through the history of Miracle Man was a fantastic read. You just have to remember that this is Dave Sim's opinion mixed with facts. And Dave Sim has a certain point of view. Kind of like how Obi-Wan Kenobi told, <laughs> told Luke. Well, yeah, that's true from a certain point of view. From a so, certain point of view. <sighs> also on that page is a Brian Michael Bendis book I knew nothing about. Yeah. Phen Phenomena Volume 1, The Golden City of Eyes. Phenomena is the story of a young boy named Bolden and his warrior friend Spike, survivors in a phenomenon that took over Earth years ago. Not an apocalypse, something far more interesting. Uh, it's $24.99. It's hardcover. 
I, if the budget allows, I'm picking this up. If the budget doesn't allow, I'll wait for the paperback. Joe. All right. You know, we were talking a bit about spider folks. Well, you could get the spider queen, spider woman, and the truly bizarre spider woman. If you go to page 224 and check out EC Comics, Heroine Heaven number five. AC and Comics, not AC. 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 I'm sorry, they all look alike to me when you don't have your readers on. AC is Americomics Comics. Yep, yep. <laughs> Which, so, you know, Department so of this apparently, Department. Or this might as well be EC. It's a collection of rare Spider-themed classic comics from the 1940s. So here's your chance to check out female wall crawlers that existed in comic books long before Stan Lee introduced Mr. Peter Parker to us and in full color. So that'd be kind of a fun book to read. Here's my problem with it, though. It's 24 pages for six bucks. And wah, it's, wah, wah. Go well, back to it's the 1940s reprint. and find the, the originals. That's the key. Or just look them up in your Guandana Land collection. Yeah, if um, it's in the Guandana Land collection. They are. Let it, these are? Yeah. Okay. And how much does the Guandana Land cost? Um, you get a lifetime subscription for $300. Okay, well, here you can just get the spider one for five ninety five. You be the judge. Anyways, continue. I am on page 247 for Archie Modern Classics Melody. These are, I like how they say, they're proud to present a symphony of all new stories so far from the last year of Digest Comics. <laughs> <laughs> These were all new when we printed them in Digest Comics, and now we're reprinting them in this. Those are new comics. <laughs> but all new, you know, in all caps, all new representations. <laughs> These are the, because they don't do a lot of uh, old school Archie comics anymore. They do have new stories in the Digest. So these are the new stories from the Digest over the last year. I'm going to go ahead and pick it up. It's 256 pages for um, $13.99. It does not say if it's digest size or not. Normally, books like this are. They probably are. Well, as long as we pop forward to Archie, I got some stuff to go backwards on. But I'm going to point out the cult, that cult of that, the cult of that Wilkin boy initiation. Yeah, they're, they seem to be going nuts with all the horror characters. So, but this one looked kind of interesting. And of course, they also are, have the trade paperbacks of the Chilling Adventures and the Blossom 666. So if you're into the Chilling Adventures stuff, you're bringing in that Welkin boy. On the next page, I, I, we'll see how long this book lasts because you got Archie and Friends, Hot Rod Racing OS, original series, I guess. But it's an introduction, introduction of Daisy Thunder. What gets me questioning is you got the Hot Rod Racing on it that's very similar to the Hot Rod Hot Wheels logo. And I don't know how swell Mattel will be uh, letting them do that. Because you look at that and that's that's the type of thing that can get you in trouble because somebody will go, well, I thought there were Hot Wheels involved with this. But it's a brand new story, Need for Speed. And of course, the first appearance of a character that may or may not make a difference. So that's it for Archie. Well, the art's by Stephen Butler, so it will oh, look yeah. pretty. I like that Stephen Butler is still drawing comics. Stephen Butler, who I first uh, saw his work when he was drawing the Badger back at First Comics. Badger, 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 Badger. Every <gasps> so often, I will point out Avatar Press is still emptying their warehouse, but only three pages. Yeah. So much like Aftershock, it looks like that they're either running out of money or running out of stuff in the warehouse. Way uh, back on page 225 under Ahoy Comics. Ahoy, ahoy. Wings, number one. Is this another exciting superhero universe? No. It's a buddy comedy about two unlucky henchmen trying to make their way in the world. Deadweights takes a hard look at what happens after the fight when the villains are tired of being villains and the heroes aren't as heroic as they want you to think. So first, they also come with six mugshot incentive covers, which are kind of funny, but I could not find any way to order those. So keep in mind that the six issue miniseries that actually sounds kind of 
Interesting. Corey? I'm looking at the stuff from Drawn and Quarterly. There are two new books that I, because of their price point, I am going to want to get reviews of because don't know anything about them other than what they say here. A Witch's Guide to Burning. A witch's work yeah. is never done when she works for the people. With the success of her town, relying on her magic demands are high. But what happens when a witch can't keep up with the magical requests? The next one is Self-Esteem and the End of the World. These are on page 277, by the way. For over 10 years, fictional Luke Healy invested all of his self-esteem into his career. But two years post-publication of his latest book, he's suffering the blow of his twin brother not finding him fit to act as their best man. Luke's career and self-esteem seem to have disintegrated, set against the backdrop of a dangerously changing global climate with melting ice caps and flooding cities. It stands two decades of tragic comedy self-discovery. Now, these are books that Ron and Quarterly, they keep their stuff in print. So I'm going to want to read the reviews of these before I am going to be plunking down the, what, um, 35 and $30 on each one, because I don't really know the creators and they don't give any interior art. So it's very much a blind crapshoot with those, but I am interested. So they're on my radar. Back on page 237, The Gun Hand from American Mythology, picking up roughly 100 years after Mary Shelley's legendary novel of Science Gone Awry, the immortal monster created by Victor Frankenstein finds himself transported from the icy waters of the North to New York, 1888. He's, the monster is attacked, loses his right arm to the elbow by a crewman's ax as he flees into the sprawling city. That's where chance and dark magics will ultimately give the monster the upper hand, a magical arm that will fight him at every turn, drag him across America on a wild, weird journey filled with action, adventure, drama, and horror. And meanwhile, at the Golden State, 3,000 miles away, the arms master is calling his arm home, unaware of the change that has occurred. So this is the first original series created by Previews editor Marty Grosser. And hmm. Matt's blog does the art. So again, I don't know if American Mythology does trades, but that series definitely caught my attention. You got a number of different variant covers to choose. Now, here's a book I, I just want to mention, and it was on my to-buy list, but recent things made me decide not to. And I wanted to get your take on it, Corey, or if you want to wait and talk about it. On page 252, Atria Book had a book called Ringmasters, Vince McMahon and the Unmaking of America. Obviously, woefully out of date at the moment. <laughs> How would you like to be the person oh. who has spent a huge amount of time on this? I know. And, you know, you, you've got it. You're ready to go to press. And then a bombshell hits. And I don't want to go deep into the lawsuit. You can read up on it yourself, yeah. but it's vile. And we find out that Vince McMahon, his stuff wasn't just that he had had an affair with a woman and paid her not to talk about it, but the stuff stuff he did was vile. And when this <sighs> book comes out, you know, it, it's already edited it's from a major yeah. publisher. So it's like, oh, crap. You know, and a lot of this, too, is it's interviews from people who grew up with him, his childhood friends. So it might and also from people accused McMahon of destroying their lives. So you're kind of like, it, I, I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't pick I'll this up because it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be incomplete. Yeah, yeah, especially now. It would be like buying a book about Donald Trump that's supposedly about his whole life that was printed in 2015. Yeah, it's like, really? You miss a big part of his life? Yeah. Okay, so skip that. Go to page 258, AWA Rumpus Room, trade paperback. This is a reprint, uh, reprint, graphic novel of one through five. Bob Shrunk, technocrat, billionaire, collector of bad art, volume of hideous skin condition can only be treated with a highly illicit and definitely not FDA approved face cream that must be harvested from human beings. 
I talked about it when it came out. Here's your chance to get the trade. And I don't think, I think that's the only thing new from AWA. Corey, oh, we already talked about that 30th anniversary she thing. That's yeah. on page 276, by the way, if you want to check it out. The one thing that is new, if you want to call it an ash can or an art edition, he's doing a she pencils ash can edition. It's 25 bucks, but it's just the pencils only. So if you're for, an artist. For issue one. Yeah, for issue one. And then, of course, the anniversary art edition, which, again, I, I picked up all of she stuff, but I'm not in it just for the art. So I didn't actually pick that up. But we mentioned it earlier. There it is. For me, the next stuff I am pointing out is going to be all the way up to page 302. Fantagraphics. Ah, oh, another, like drawn in quarterly. They have, get, get, I got to win that lottery because I just buy almost everything they come up with. Except maybe well, first off is a sequel that we didn't know that we would be able to get. One of their books, My Favorite Thing is Monsters by Emil Ferris, came out a few years ago. And it was a huge success, really well done. It ended with to be continued in volume two, and then it was solicited and it never came out, and it was solicited and it never came out. And Fanagraphics finally said that she, the artist had broken their contract because they were supposed to deliver it years ago and never did. The artist countersued, and now volume two is coming out. <laughs> Can we all just so, get along? So I am picking this up, but I have a feeling that the behind the scenes story will be just as good as the comic. Then on the next page, page 303, the complete web of horror. This is a hardcover. It is reprinting. Now I'm going to warn you, this magazine is public domain. So I have the Guandana land of it. But Fantagraphics does beautiful work. Guadana Land. Guadana Land. But, but this is The Complete Web of Horror, which was a horror magazine that came out in the early 70s. It was to compete with Creepy and Eerie and the stuff from Skywald and the stuff from Eerie Publications. It has early art from Bernie Wrightson, Michael Kaluta, Bruce Jones, Ralph Reese, Frank Brunner, Roger Brandt, Wayne Howard, and other people such as Sid Shores, who worked for Marvel from the 40s up. Um, Fanagraphics presents all three published issues, plus nearly a dozen recently unearthed stories that have rarely or never before been published. The Complete Web of Horror features a wealth of essays, a foreword by Terry Bisson, an account of the magazine's origin, rise, and demise, plus reminiscences by Robert Lewis and others. This is how you should do a public domain property. It reminds me of the EC Pictofiction, which came out long after, I, oh, a decade after they had printed the pre-code, I'm sorry, the pre-trend stuff. What happened with EC was the pre-trend was all of the stuff they published before they started doing um, crypt, uh, I'm sorry, Tales from the Crypt, et cetera, et cetera. Then the comics code pretty much killed them. So when Mad was a hit, they tried to move to magazines and they had these magazines called Pictofiction. And it was supposed to come out like early 1990s. But it didn't because there were all these stories of stuff that William Gaines had in the vault. And what they found was he had stuff from issues that hadn't been printed. He had uh, original Frank Frazetta art that was supposed to be used for future issues. They had all this stuff in the archives and they had to take a long time to sort of put it together. That's what they're doing with this. They're getting stuff from these artists who are still alive or working with their their heirs and their estates to get stuff that was supposed to be in future issues that never saw print, as well as kind of wrapping around it with essays and interviews and stuff to explain everything about this. So while I have the three issues in a really nice oversized paperback and digitally, 
I am picking this up. That's why you can get me to double dip. Give me the Criterion Edition DVD version of a book and I will pick it up. Then on the next page, God, Fanagraphics is just eating my wallet. Ugh. <laughs> the Fabulous Furry Freak Brothers. Yes. The Seventh Voyage and Other Follies. This reprints the Fabulous Furry Freak Brothers cool down in Mexico where they're chased off the a beach, encounter a Mexican mystic, lose all their money, get thrown in jail, escape through an underground labyrinth, wind up on a secret poppy farm run by the U.S. military. Please. I love the fabulous furry freak brothers. It's an underground, but it wasn't a, we're going to do everything we can to fucking shock you. It's more, we can't do these kind of stories. We're going to do stories about stoners that really are just sort of modern versions of old wacky comedies from the 20s and 30s. It's so much fun, so beautifully drawn uh, by Gilbert Shelton and Dave Sheridan. If you have not picked up any of the Fabulous Furry Freak Brothers, do yourself a favor and pick it up. It's one of the, I would say, the, the most accessible of the undergrounds from the 60s, and it was so popular that they kept doing it into the 90s. Joe? On page 317 from Humanoids, Eden, desperate to, sh it's a graphic novel, desperate to escape a dying Earth, a family schemes their way onto a massive spaceship toward a new planet, Eden. But shortly after they take off, they discover the terrifying truth, and their journey toward salvation becomes a fight to survive. Story of corporate greed and capitalism left unchecked in an all too imaginable future. And what's beautiful about it is you get a nice pitch on it and not only one, two, three, four pages. Oh, are you kidding? Five, six pages of art to check out to see if this is a graphic novel you'd be interested in. Well done, humanoids. I, I love it when you do stuff like that. Corey? Page 339 from Labyrinth Road, Blood City Rollers. Ice Skater Mina is on a one-track path to Olympic gold and glory. That is until she totally wipes out at her biggest competition and is kind of sort of kidnapped by undead kids on roller skates. Sucked into the high stakes world of paranormal roller derby, she finds herself recruited by a squad of vampires who need a human player to complete their team. Okay, you've got me already. I, I just don't understand how Netflix didn't pick this up. And then you look at the art and it's drawn a lot like Scott Pilgrim. Now, sadly, you only get the postage stamp size art. But my God, this looks like fun. It's just, we're going to throw every weird, wacky thing in and just go with it. That's how you win me over to new creators and, uh, you know, a publisher and a comic that I don't know. Just have fun. This book sounds so much fun. Joe? On page 337, under Keen Spot Entertainment, Robot Plus Girl Number One. It's all age adventure. Let's see. A robot on the brink of obsolescence wanders aimlessly through the city, ready to give up on life and donates himself for spare parts until a girl stumbles across his broken, discarded body. In appreciation of her compassion and empathy, the robot attempts to help the girl out with a financial windfall. However, unbeknownst to him, his procurement of funds brings unwanted conflict with the powers that be. As the girl tries to fix the robot's ethical oversights, he gets apprehended by the unknown, uh, by unknown assailants and must now fight for the life he once wanted to give up if he ever wants to see his newfound friend again. So again, one of those things that just kind of, I read, caught my attention, sounds interesting. I also want to point out Keen Spot Entertainment started in the early 2000s as we're, we'll publish your web strip back when web strips were super hot and everybody thought they would make money. And if you think web strips will make money, Mark Wade sold his entire comic collection to start a web strip company and within a year was back writing comics again. <laughs> <laughs> but they are still around. They're still publishing comics. They've never had a huge knockout hit. 
but they've got a big, solid fan base. They publish, you know, four to six comics every month, and they've just been at it forever. So they're doing something right. And Joe's right. This sounds like a fun book. For me, my next one is in Oni Press, page 364. I've mentioned it the last two times. The Sixth Gun, Omnibus, Volume 6. This volume reprints the Sixth Gun, the stunning conclusion, as well as the miniseries that came afterward. So with this one, the Sixth Gun is completed. The dogs of war are gnawing at their leashes. The forces of darkness have hounded Becky Moncrief since she first placed her hands on the sixth gun. Now Becky and her allies are taking the fight to their enemies. Their goal, destroy the cursed gun once and for all. But the Grey Witch has plans of her own and she stages a shocking counterattack. The unexpected outcome of the battle will change the fate of the six forever and our defenders of the gun come to the epic conclusion of their story. Really excited about getting this in one big chunk. Joe? As long as we're in Oni, I'll jump forward. A couple things to point out. Page 364 has the best of Rick and Morty slipcase edition, if you have a friend who likes it. Page 362, Dwellings hardcover. I've been looking at this. I've seen the issues on the shelf at the source. It's shock, terror, and wry humor. Very twisted check it out if, if that sounds like something you want. As far as new stuff on page 354, oh, a Kogan brutalizer of gods. In an age thought forgotten, when man, monster, and the divine all strode the earth, a lone warrior emerges to test the immortality of the cruel gods who would deal destruction with impunity. He is the one man wrecking, reckoning that stands in defiance of his divine masters with the sword in hand and a thirst for God blood. And this looks to be, it might be an ongoing series, I can't tell. Limited series, there it is. Corey? I want to point out that the second issue of Penthouse Comics is coming out. Yes. No, 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 it's not all porn. Not all. Although some of the covers look not very porny. Yeah, and they actually have one that's begged for your protection. Yes. Mature readers, the original version of Penthouse Comics was far better than it should have been. So I'm giving this one a try. The first issue comes out. Joe, do you know when the first issue comes out? I don't know. It's coming out on Valentine's Day. Oh. <laughs> Joe? All right. I'm going to point out. Back on page 340, you have Dick Tracy returning. Who's Dick Tracy? Well, okay, whatever. Okay, back on page, uh, <laughs> let, let's go back to page 338. A number one from Cronkret Comics, Zuriel number one. After long hiatus, Zuriel returns to the streets. While on the hunt for a missing person, she uncovers something truly disturbing. Has her absence led to an overflow of supernatural activity? Can she restore order to it, or is it already too late? That's all you got, but they show the cover, and it looks interesting. Corey? If you go to page 371, we've got a comic for kids. Marvel, what if Loki was worthy? So many worlds, so little time, infinite possibilities creating infinite realities. Long have I watched the trickster gods sow chaos, but what if Loki saved Asgard from Tony Stark's revenge? Thor, the son of Odin, god of thunder, wielder of Molnir is dead, and Loki is responsible. It was meant only as a joke, tampering with the destroyer, changing Thor's course to Midgard, a bit of mischief with a chance of maiming but loki's harmless prank spirals out of control unleashing death and discretion on new york city and the heroes sworn to protect it 272 pages digest size graphic novel made for kids but boy it sounds really fun and the i'm sorry the what if series on marvel unlimited I, i've loved every episode of it just every episode so of it where where it, is that located Page 371. 371, because again, it's not in the Marvel, so it's something you may overlook it. It's under Random House Worlds. Joe? 
let's see. Uh, remember I talked about that? Uh, what was her name? You probably not. Who is Taylor Swift? Penguin Workshop on page 367 has a book. Who is Taylor Swift's soft cover? I mention this because if I had a comic shop, I would be buying this stuff because somebody's going to buy it. And they're probably all unauthorized. Well, Penguin Workshop might be authorized. Who knows? But are you, do you know what's going on with Rude Dude? He's got these $1 newspaper yes. strips coming out. That's the next one I have. This okay. is a weekly release schedule. Nexus, the newspaper strips. It's a five-issue weekly series. going to be 24 pages. For The first one is 50 cents. The rest are all a buck. He did a bunch of newspaper strips. He was going to put them in all in one big book. But they've announced that they're going to do it this way. They're dirt cheap. And it's Steve Rude art, for God's sakes. Buy it. Uh, Steve Rude is one of the greatest artists to ever work in comics. His nexus with Mike Barron, one of the greatest characters. They've come to an agreement where Mike Barron is going to do Nexus stories for Dark Horse with other artists. Kind of like when they were at first, when Steve Rude could not keep up with the monthly schedule, they had other artists doing Nexus stories. They've kind of split the property. Steve Rude will be doing his Nexus stories. Mike Barron will be doing his Nexus stories. They're not going to be connected in any way. And I read the last Mike Barron Nexus trade paperback. And it has that goofy, weird comedy that he would put in Nexus, as well as the seriousness of a Nexus story. Steve Rude was more wanting to do high, basically um, science fiction, high drama, and his art takes a long time, but it's worth it. You buy these. They're cheap. Buy them. They're going to be fantastic. Joe? All right, the last thing I want to point out, and then I have a question for you, Corey. On page 385, and under University Press of Mississippi, you've got Hannah and Barbara conversation soft cover. It's more of a reference book, so it's a little expensive, but it's the first collection of its kind about Bill Hannah and Joe Barbera's likely they're likely the most prolific animation producers of the 20th century. Hannah and Barbara conversation presents a lively portrait of Bill and Joe, the influential producers behind Tom and Jerry, the Flintstones, Scooby-Doo, the Smurfs, probably nothing you've heard of, but they've done hundreds of other cartoon characters who continue to this day to entertain the world. It's encompassing more than 50 years of film and television history. The conversation in this volume includes conversations that is include first person accounts by the namesakes of the Hanna Barbera studio as well as recollection by artists and executives who were closely with the pair for decades. So a lot of these books that come through from university presses are really, really, I mean they're expensive, but they're worth it. So this I would point that actually, out. This one isn't all that expensive. It's not a, really it's a smaller size paperback. But it's almost 300 pages. And what these conversations books are, are they reprint interviews that the people involved have had. So I recently read the Steve Gerber one. It was fantastic because they put each interview in context as when it was, what was going on, wh where it was printed, things like that. So this one looks really cool. The page before, however, page 383, this may as well be a book. It's listed as a magazine, but it's going to be, you know, it's it's going to be a trade larger magazine sized book, basically. Alter Ego 188th, the 25th anniversary at Tomorrow's. Roy Thomas has been printing his fanzine Alter Ego, 188 issues. This is the 25th anniversary. It celebrates 25 years. It's going to have interviews with John Buscema, Marie Severin, Jim Mooney, George Tuska, plus uh, see Stanley's dinner with Alan Rezels, as annotated by Sean Howe, who did that beautiful book about Marvel a few years ago. 
On the DC side, we have interviews with Carmine Infantino, John Broom, Julie Schwartz, Joe Kubert, Murray Anderson, a special photo feature on Gardner Fox, and basically back issue handles bronze and modern age. Alter Ego handles golden and silver age. They cross over at times, you know, where the, the Alter Ego will have some bronze age stuff, back issue will have some silver age stuff, but this looks to be just a great, great book interviewing people. You know, I haven't read a lot of John Buscema interviews because he didn't do a lot of interviews. It, the back issue, which is on the next page, they're going to be, it's a Marvel Mania issue. So it's going to be covering Marvel Mania, which was the first Marvel fan club. Marvel Age, Marvel Classics, the Marvel Novels, the Marvel Value Stamps, and it has interviews with Chris Claremont, Jack Kirby, Kevin McGuire, Roy Thomas, cover illustration by Sal Buscema, interviews with Fabian Nisaja on Captain America, interview with uh, Kurt Busiek and Alex Ross as Marvels turns 30. But I think it's going to be interesting for the Marvel Mania because who? We should do an entire episode on Marvel Mania at some point, Joe, because oh, yeah. boy, that ended up being such a total scam. And every the, the owner involved was such a weasel. And Mark Evanier has dished all kinds of dirt on it. But that is it for me. Now, the last two things I want to point out, Corey, go to page 390, 391, and 392. They have listed... Tons of Will Eisner graphic novels. Yeah, okay. Yep. If you're I rich, wanted, I wanted if you're to rich, one. buy them all. But if you had to tell, okay, Will, Will Eisner, a god in comics, what would you give to somebody who's never, ever seen anything Will Eisner and you want to say, well, let's get you rolling on this guy? Will Eisner, the dreamer. It's right. a little overpriced because it's only 54 pages. But what it is, it's about Eisner's early years in the thriving comics industry prior to World War One, talking about what early comics were like up until he it, he became a publisher. And what it was, he was a packager. He would put together comics and then take them around to the different publishers. Hey, do you want to buy this series? If you do, I'll bring it every month and et cetera, et cetera. But it's really one of the best books about the early days of comics from an artist who was there at the beginning. The other one that everyone, that I think is one of the most important books that Eisner ever did is on the next page. And that is The Plot. The Secret History of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. And I think it's very important for us to know about now because the Elders of Zion. Well, I'll read this here. The plot, which examines the astonishing conspiracy and fabrication of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, has become a worldwide phenomenon since its hard publication. Um, the Protocols, first published in 1902, had become gospel truth to international millions, presenting a pageant of historical figures. It, this, this doesn't give a good idea. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion was this anti-Jewish book that was published that was supposedly someone had snuck in to where the Jewish conspiracy was and wrote down all the stuff they they were planning to do across the world as they took over the world. And it was put together by anti-Semites. And it was believed to the point where Henry Ford put out a book that pretty much was a version of that. And if you went into a Ford dealership before World War II, Henry Ford's book would be on the seat of the on the seat of the car when you bought it. He had a newspaper where he printed anti-Semitic editorials. This was huge and it was where the idea of what they called the blood libel was, which was Jews are kidnapping Christian children to use their blood for unleavened bread. 
and you're thinking to yourself, that's insane. Well, the whole QAnon thing is a repackaging of that, where these, and it, if you dig into the conspiracy of QAnon, it's the evil Jews are controlling politicians who are kidnapping children to have sex with them, kill them, and eat them. So it has not gone away. It just keeps getting repackaged. And Eisner's book, The Plot, goes into where it came from, how it was distributed, how it was used over the years to spread this anti-Semitic propaganda. And here's the thing. It says that this has been taught in schools. When I was a kid, this was not taught in school. So much of it leading up to World War II was scrubbed and sanitized to, well, you know, the Nazis were always bad and everybody in America knew it. So as soon as Pearl Harbor was bombed, we went into World War II. No, the reason we did not get involved was because the uh, the Germans, they were real. The, the Nazism was really popular here. You had an America First Party headed by people like Charles Lindbergh and Father Conklin, who we're basically saying Germany's right. We need to get rid of the Jews and we need to have a fascist state to stop communism. And then after World War II, they got rid of the Nazi part, but still we must fight communism. And it's a part of our history that I was so scrubbed that even now as stuff comes out about it, I'm amazed that within, you know, it's only been 80 years and it was completely scrubbed. There's so much we don't know about it. We, there's so much we don't know about how the, the Nazis had people working for congressmen sending out speeches that were sent by Garibals as this is what your representative said this week. So wrap it all up, I would give somebody the book The Dreamer, but I think The Plot is one of the most important books that Eisner ever did. And I really wish more people knew about the history of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Well, that makes my last thing I'm going to recommend seem tame by comparison. In manga, page 403, The Art of Majaz, Menage A3. It's from, you love this book. Oh, I, it's it's an R-rated webcomic that follows Montreal roommates Carrie, Dee Dee, and Z. Sexy hijinks, awkward moments, and wacky adventures. I laughed. I cried. I thought it was freaking hilarious. The hardcover is on top. All three, all five of the back issues are down below. And I got to double check. I think I've got them all, but I love this one. It was brilliant. Uh, Corey, I'd like we ran long because we're actually having a bit of fun here. I would like to suggest we're going to make let's make uh, Brian wait, and as part of our review stuff for next week, we'll start with the other toys and things we might suggest Brian buy next week. Okay, but we still have to mention these guys, our sponsors. Our newest sponsor is NordVPN. Let's be honest, if you're out on the internet, you need a VPN to protect you. There's all sorts of things going on on the internet where people can track you. You could accidentally download a keylogger, uh, all sorts of things. NordVPN gives the best security possible. It has a password manager, which generates complex passwords, syncs across all your devices, stores your notes and credit card information. It also gives you 10 gigabytes of private cloud storage, um, secure files that backs up your data automatically. But the main thing it gives you is peace of mind. It gives you peace of mind when you're um, out on the internet, when you're streaming, when you're playing games, when you're listening to podcasts like this one. It gives you safety anywhere at any time. It protects your online activity. You get full access to all content. And if you use the link, go.nordvpn.net sh3ku, it'll take you to where you can get a great deal for a one-month plan, a two-year plan, a one-year plan. They are 
our newest sponsor. We're happy to have them. And if you would like to sponsor something here at any of the podcasts on the Solitaire Rose Network, you can. Just email me, solitairerosenetwork at gmail.com. Thanks. Well, absolutely. And because we've gone long and it's, God, it's 11. I know. How long have we been doing this thing? It's over two, and usually two I'm not and a half honest. hours. Usually, I'm not the one to call call out and say, "Oh no, no, we're done." But <clears throat> one freaking one geeking, Joe. Okay. Uh, freaking wise, just health, and it's kind of a freaking in a positive way. I got to reach out from someone who said yes. I to go to a therapist, and I find it. Uh, Worthwhile, so I, I kind of like that reaching out. I think being in therapy, people are I think it's it's misunderstood. It's probably looked down upon, it's demonized. But the more it comes out, the more people realize, hey, you know, we all could use someone in our corner that's not a friend, family, and that will you know help you out. Uh, I say that because okay, Chris is doing fine. Her health is you know she's healing from her. Uh, now my brain fired. She had the nose thing done, the uh, deviated septum surgery. That's what I'm thinking of. My father, he fell during while Chris was recovering, and he's in the rehab home. And, of course, it's going to take – he wants to go home. He's like, I got to go home now. I said, yeah, well, you can't stand up without help. So – and, again, I get it because I had to relearn how to walk with my hips. But when you're 87 with a broken pelvis, it's a little tougher. So – People have been reaching out and, you know, I I think the emotions people feel, and Corey, you could probably back me up on this, when your parents are sick or are hospitalized or go down or die, it's all similar. It's just when it happens to you for the first time, it's tough. So go out and get help. Talk to friends. Talk to therapists. Uh Again, this is a freaking and a geeking because it's still freaking me out. But, you know, I'm there for my dad, and uh, I'll do what I can to help him out. Corey, what you freaking on? I have not mentioned it because it's I, – I, well, I'm going to mention one quickly, and then there was another that popped up today that I'm going to spend a little more time on. Uh, Comixology from Amazon is completely gone now. All your stuff from Comixology has sort of migrated over to Kindle. However, on Comixology, you could subscribe to digital comics and things like that. You can't do that anymore. You haven't lost anything. But it, it, I obviously, it wasn't making enough money for Amazon. But, man, reading that stuff on the Kindle app is so much worse than reading on the Comixology app, which was built for comics. But I want to bring up a passing another of the i would say bronze age creators has passed away jose delbo has passed away most people would know him from his run in the 70s on wonder woman joe you would probably know him from his run on transformers mm -hmm. yeah but also he worked on a number of other books, including Fabian Nasasia pointed out, Super Pro. But I think his, his contribution to comics as being an artist is only about half the story because he also worked at the School of Visual Arts. And he also worked at Joe Kubert's school where he spent years teaching up and coming artists how to do comics and so many of his students are people who work in comics now or worked in comics through the 90s and 2000s and they've been sharing these wonderful stories about how he would teach them and not by going no that's wrong he'd go i don't like that car i want you to spend tonight and tomorrow figuring out why i don't like that car And that's kind of a Socratic method of rather than giving information, you ask questions. But with art, it's more, there's something wrong with that. I need you to figure it out so that when you do figure it out, you don't make the same mistake in the past rather than, it, it, that's wrong, redraw it. And there are so many wonderful stories 
about him as a teacher. I hope that somebody gathers a lot of them up. I know that Tomorrow's puts out wonderful books about artists. I only knew about his art. I did not know about the teaching until just recently. But another of our Bronze Age artists have passed away. And it's why I tell people when you go to a convention, go to the older artists, thank them for what they did. You're not going to get to, you know, you're, you're not going to get to spend a lot of time with them. That's why Sal Buscema is still around. Every time he has his birthday, I put up a long post about him because Sal Buscema is one of those guys who he did wonderful work, but he was never a fan favorite. And I think there are a lot of people who were just, they were just good artists who didn't get the image tent style treatment. And I think that we as fans need to kind of say, hey, you know what? I really liked your work. Your work meant a lot to me. Um, Sal Buscema, he's actually closed his um, waiting list for sketches because he has enough until he's 95 now and he's 88, I believe. So he's got a waiting list of six years at this point. But take your time to go to the Bronze, Art, Bronze Age artists. And even, you know, the artists who worked in the 80s, they're starting to get into their 60s. Time never stops, man. It keeps marching on. Um, I, will, I will miss hearing all these stories about what a great teacher Jose was. Joe, what are you geeking on? Tomorrow's Let's my end birthday. this on a happy note. Tomorrow's my birthday. I've got box day. My box is still sealed and ready to go. And what's even more fun is in a couple of weeks, the Minnesota Comic Exchange has their comic show. February 24th, show, so. Valley Creek Mall, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Free admission. It's all ages. Come get some. Corey, what you geeking on? I got box day on Saturday. Yay. There were five, what, four hardcover omnibuses, two softcover omnibuses. The new Knights of the Dinner Table, which is much thicker, and but I've only read one book. Damn. And I'm only partway through it. The Atlas to Arted Sedition, Volume 1, Joe Manili. Joe Manili could well be the most important Marvel Comics artist that people have not heard of unless they listen to this show where I give him his props, his flowers, and his praises. This, first off, the book is treasury size, a, a little bigger than treasury size. I did not know it was going to be that much bigger. It's huge. Um, it has a long essay by Doc V about the life of. Uh, Joe Manili, including he did one, count them, one cover for DC, which is reprinted. He did a comic strip with Stan Lee called Ms. Lo Mrs. Lion and Her Cubs. Do you think Stan would ever reuse that name? Joe? Never. Well, oh, yeah, he would. Yeah, he, he, that was the name of the dog on Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends. But it was a comic strip about Cub Scouts. And while they, it didn't last long enough for the Cub Scouts to sort of officially license the Cub Scouts over to it, that's what they were working on. They got in a bunch of papers, but then after, after Joe Manili passed away, Stan didn't want to do it anymore because he, he didn't, he was so hurt and devastated by Joe's passing. It's like, yeah, it wasn't a huge seller. We had to do a lot of work to get it to build up. And I just didn't want to do that work with anybody else is what, he's, what he said in a few interviews. But it reprints his early work all the way up to his last few Two Gun Kid stories. There's his horror, his romance, his war comics, his parody comics, back when Mad Comics, the Mad Comic was such a huge hit. Marvel had a couple. He did stories, and I'm reading it, and it's like, these are so good. He he would put in as much detail as Will Elder did in, you know, hiding gags in the background. But it's just such a wonderful book. If you get a chance to take a look at it, the printing just pops. 
it's much bigger. It's beautifully scanned. You could tell that they went through, they did computer corrections to, you know, get rid of the fading, fading colors and problems with the printing back then. It, it's one of the most beautiful books I've ever seen reprinting stuff from the 50s that's not an EC book. I am just blown away by this book. I am so in love with it that I cannot recommend it enough. Pretty soon, Joe's going to be able to, he'll have a list of artists like John Buscema, Jack Kirby, Joe Manili, who he could just mention and he can go up, go to the bathroom, come back, and and I won't have ever know he's been gone. I'm going to guess. Believe it or not, kids, you've listened to us blather on about funny books for two and a half hours. <sighs> and we're still not done. To be continued. And as we say every week, the comic we like the least, we still like better than the comic that you uh, like the most, Joe. Five ants rented an apartment with five other ants. Now they're ten ants. <sighs> <laughs> I live for that. Corey, hit my music.